Our opening thought comes from the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development from the United Nations. It reads, we recognize that eradicating poverty in all of its forms and dimensions, including extreme poverty, is the greatest global challenge and an indispensable requirement for sustainable development. All countries and all stakeholders acting in collaborative partnership will implement this plan. We are resolved to free the human race from the tyranny of poverty and want and to heal and secure our planet. We are determined to take the bold and transformative steps which are urgently needed to shift the world into a sustainable and resilient path. As we embark on this collective journey, we pledge that no one will be left behind. Our next reading comes from a book called For the Common Good, Redirecting the Economy Toward Community, the Environment, and a Sustainable Future. And it's actually by Herman Daly and John B. Cobb, Jr. Herman Daly and John B. Cobb, Jr. Cobb and Daly wrote, if economics is reconceived in the service of community, it will begin with a concern for agriculture and specifically for the production of food. This is because a healthy community will be a relatively self-sufficient one. A community's complete dependency on outsiders for its mere survival weakens it. It is often unable to develop the policies it desires for the sake of its own members, since its survival depends on terms dictated by others. The most fundamental requirement for survival is food. Hence, how and where food is grown is foundational to an economics for community. Our second reading is from Kate Rayworth, who is the author of Donut Economics, Seven Ways to Think Like a 21st Century Economist. She writes, what if we started economics not with its long established theories, but with humanity's long-term goals, and then sought out the economic thinking that would enable us to achieve them? I tried to draw a picture of those goals, and ridiculous though it sounds, it came out looking like a donut. Yes, the American kind with a hole in the middle. The full diagram is set out in the next chapter, but in essence, it is a pair of concentric rings. Below the inner ring, the social foundation, lie critical human deprivations, such as hunger and illiteracy. Beyond the outer ring is the ecological ceiling, and beyond that ring lies critical planetary degradation, such as climate change and biodiversity loss. Between those two rings is the donut itself, the space in which we can meet the needs of all within the means of the planet. In 2018, which seems like such a long time ago now, Kate Rayworth, who's a uh, University of Oxford economist, published the book titled Donut Economics. She published it as an alternative to the dominant perspectives on economics that typically focus on growth, especially the growth in our gross domestic product as being the most important measure of economic progress. Rayworth, in her book, makes the case that economic growth should no longer be the primary way to understand societal flourishing, but that rather we need to focus on economic activity that keeps us within the limits of Earth's carrying capacity, our planetary means, while making sure that the resources needed for human flourishing are distributed more equitably. The concept of sustainable development has been around for some time. Rayworth didn't create it, but she is certainly building on it. The concept was 
first defined and developed by the World Commission on Environment and Development that was formed in 1983, and then it was chaired by the Norwegian Prime Minister Gro Harlem Brutland. Gro Harlem Brutland. This commission became known, it was named after her, it became known the Brutland Commission. And it developed a report that was published in 1987 titled Our Common Future. If you haven't heard about it, it's understandable. A lot of people haven't heard about it. It's too bad because it was an incredible report, Our Common Future in 1987. If we had heeded that report, if we had listened to that report and acted upon that report as we should have, we would be living in a very different present today with a very different future ahead of us. In that report, Our Common Future, Brundtland defined sustainable development as follows. Sustainable development is the development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. The report, Our Common Future, and its definition of sustainable development helped pave the way for a number of international documents and international agreements, many of which have not been followed as fully as they should. And those documents and agreements dealt with economic justice, ecological sustainability, climate justice, and also included eventually in 2015 what we know as the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. The United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. What many people may not know is that the persons who worked on those sustainable development goals and put together those 17 goals, kept an image before them that helped them develop and integrate the 17 goals that they created. And believe it or not, that image that they kept before them as they worked on those goals was, yes, the image of a donut. The traditional American kind of donut not the cream-filled donut, not the jelly-filled donut, the donut with a hole in the middle. <laughs> yes, the image most commonly found in Homer Simpson's dreams became the guiding image for the development of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. If you didn't get the Homer Simpson joke, watch The Simpsons, he loves donuts. <laughs> and the creator of that donut image is the Oxford economist Kate Raythorn. I'm sorry, Ray Worth. Ray Worth's donut provides a new image, a new model, a new picture for how we do economics. But before we take a bite of the donut, so to speak, to examine its values as a new image or picture for economic theory and practice, let's first see why Ray Worth came to the conclusion that economics needed a new model and a new guiding image, a new picture. Ray Worth shares the story in her book, Donut Economics, of an Oxford University student named Yuan Yang, who arrived at Oxford to study economics in 2008. Yang found that the economic theory she was learning there at Oxford was absurdly narrow in its assumptions. It was not dealing with the bigger picture of human society or with the reality that we are living within the context of a larger ecological community. Young's further, outs further study of economics at the master's level, where she went to the London School of Economics to study, was just as disappointing as her undergraduate studies at the University of Oxford. She found herself simply having to master the material and was left wondering how it actually mattered, how it actually mattered in relation to the real world crises that we are facing, the crises of global inequality 
and the climate crisis. The student Young was seeing, like so many other students of economics in the past few decades, that mainstream economic theory does not deal with the multi-dimensional challenges of the 21st century of our time. And Kate Rayworth also saw in her work as a student, in her work doing international development, in her work as an economist at the University of Oxford, she also saw the need to go beyond the constraints of mainstream economic theory. And she concluded that only debunking the, the ideas of the old ways of thinking was not enough. You can't just debunk the old ways of thinking. She concluded that we must also bring forth new ideas, a new model, a new image for economics. And her book, Donut Economics, is an attempt to put forth this new model. Rayworth recognizes that in some ways, we as humanity over the past many decades, past 60 years or so, in many ways, we've made some great strides. We've made some great strides in human well-being. In relation to poverty, we've seen a number of persons come out of poverty in the world. Also, in relation to hunger, we've been able to deal with issues of hunger in ways that many thought were impossible just 50 years ago. But we also face significant and deepening challenges and problems, some of which have become crises, and some of which have become existential threats to the existence of humanity, to the existence of human civilization, and much of life on Earth. We are experiencing an increasing inequality and deepening degradation of our planetary home, especially in relation to the climate crisis, habitat loss, species loss, population and consumption growth, with a lot of emphasis on the consumption growth. And this summer, of course, puts uh, some of those crises, I think, in bold relief, especially the crises related to climate injustice, to the climate crisis. And I think in 15 or 20 years, those of us who are still around in 15 or 20 years will be longing for a summer like the summer of 2023, when it was so relatively mild and calm. In 15 or 20 years, this will seem like a mild and calm summer. Rayworth notes that how we understand economics and the economic models and images that we use really matters because economic theory and practice is so powerful, so influential within our society. In fact, she says it has too much influence on our lives. <clears throat> Think about the prestige of the Nobel Prize in economics and how much power and authority those persons, usually men, who receive that prize have <clears throat> in having influence on the way we live within society and the way that we do economics. Rayworth notes this problem of too much influence and authority of the economic. And she recognizes the dominance of the, of the economist perspective on the world, the dominance of economics in public life, and the dominance of mainstream economic theory, she says, has been strengthened by the language and the mindset that so many of us were influenced by in our introductory economics courses. Anybody had an introductory course in economics in your life? Econ 101? <laughs> I, I had something like that when I was, I think, a, a junior in college as part of my general education curriculum. And she says the language, and the mindset of Econ 101 is rooted in textbooks from 1950, and those textbooks from 1950 that went through multiple editions, I think the edition I had was the 11th edition that was published in 1980, 
Those are rooted in theories, she argues, from 1850. So the kind of model, the kind of image that we've all learned for the most part comes from 1950, rooted in theories from 1850. And much of the influence of Econ 101 and of the mainstream economic theory that it purports strengthens and perpetuates a way of being in the world that is unsustainable. And that influence is strengthened and perpetuated by pictures, by images that reinforce the dominant model. I don't know if you can think back to your Econ 101 course, but there were diagrams, there were pictures. The circular flow of money in the economy was one of those. The diagrams of GDP, hopefully growing and growing and growing. The supply and demand, all those pictures and diagrams influence the way we think about economics, influence the way we understand economic theory and practice. And Ray Worth notes the power of these pictures and the fact that our brains are wired for visuals. It really is truer than we think, perhaps, that a picture is worth a thousand words. Pictures and images go into our long-term memory. For the most part, words stay within our short-term memory, but pictures stay within our long-term memory. And given the dominant role of visualization in our human cognition, Rayworth maintains that a new model of economics will require the creation of new pictures, new guiding images for us to, to learn how to act in relation to the world from an economic perspective. We learn best, she says, when we have pictures to look at. My students say this all the time. Give me something visual, right? Don't just lecture. Give me something visual. So Ray Worth is noting that. She's seeing that. But she says right now, we all have in our minds, whether we really know it or not, we all have in our minds the graffiti of an old economic mindset. That graffiti of an old economic mindset is lodged in our brains. And Rayworth notes that as we struggle to escape from the dominant models, from the dominant paradigms of mainstream economic theory, we should recognize that the new models that we create, the new images that we create, the new pictures we make, they're going to be wrong. They're, all of our models are wrong to a certain extent. They're not all-encompassing. They don't explain everything about the reality of the world. All of our models are wrong, but they are more or less useful. They are more or less useful. And the problem is the models, the pictures of the dominant economic theory that we've been inheriting and practicing are less and less useful now than perhaps they were in the past, especially given the challenges and problems that we're facing in the world. And what she says is that we need now more useful alternative models to offer a way of breaking out from those old paradigms. This is why pictures are so important, because there is power in visual framing. You probably heard of George Lakoff, he, he argues that uh, progressives especially have problem with their verbal framing, he says. He says conservatives are really good at verbal framing, especially in politics. So take the example of tax relief. <laughs> so, so the conservatives put out this idea of tax relief, and, and the way they frame it verbally, how can you disagree with relief, <laughs> right? And then there's a tendency for progressives, Lakoff says, to, to deal with the language of tax relief by trying to refute it in long refutations, <laughs> verbal refutations, without having a verbal framing that will catch on 
And they even use the language of tax relief as they're trying to refute it, which just makes it even worse for the progressive cause, he argues. So he says that progressives need to think about verbal framing. And instead of tax relief, progressives should talk about tax justice. Tax justice. Well, Rayworth goes on to say that just as Lakoff is arguing that verbal framing matters, visual framing also matters. And perhaps it's even more important because new images can foster new ways of thinking. We must draw new pictures. And the new picture that Rayworth draws is the picture of the donut. The donut is a picture of how economics might achieve long-term goals of humanity while also preserving the integrity of the planet. Below the inner ring, the social foundation, you all have a donut on your bulletin if you want to look at the, the diagram there. Below the inner ring, the social foundation, lie human deprivations. We don't want anyone to fall into the hole of the donut, to face human dep deprivations of hunger, lack of shelter, not meeting the basic needs to live a good life. And then beyond the outer ring, which is the ecological ceiling, lies planetary degradation. If we live outside of the planetary means, we're going outside of the outer ring of the donut, and that leads to ecological devastation and degradation. But between these two rings, between these two rings is the donut itself, the space in which we can meet the needs of all within the me means of the planet. The space in which we can meet the needs of all within the means of the planet. So the question that Rayworth gives to all of us is this. How do we live inside the donut? Homer Simpson's heaven. <laughs> How do we live inside the donut? What economic mindset will get us there? And she takes a very holistic approach. She says we have to look at what we can learn from the, the insights of many disciplines, not just mainstream economic theory, but many disciplines as well. And she says, she argues that now is a great moment for unlearning and relearning the fundamentals of economics. And she lays out, and I'm not going to go into great detail here, but I do recommend the, the book if you have a chance to read it. And also, if you'd like to join a book discussion on every Friday uh, for the next four weeks, we started this past week on, on Donut Economics. Uh, every Friday at noon, we're having a, a book discussion. Seven ways, she lays out, to think like a 21st century economist. The first way is this. She says we have to change the goal. Change the goal. The goal right now of mainstream economic theory is always growth. It's like, it's an idol. We have to grow the economy. We have to grow the economy. No matter how much inequality there is, no matter how much ecological degradation there is, we have to grow the economy. That's the main focus of mainstream economic theory. And she argues that we have to change the goal from growth to thriving in balance, staying in that donut. The second way is that we have to see the big picture. E economic theory, mainstream economic theory, tends to abstract away from the concrete reality of our lived existence with each other. What she argues is that we have to see the big picture. We have to embed the economy within human society as a whole, but also within nature. The economy is part of nature. We are part of nature. We live within nature, and it's all powered by the sun. The third way is that we have to nurture human nature. We can't forget human nature as we think about economics. We are social, interdependent, approximating, approximating fluid in values, and dependent upon the living world. So, much, so many people who adhere to mainstream economic theory think that human society isn't real. 
It's just an abstraction. She's saying we have to think about human nature and the importance of our being social beings. Fourth, she argues we have to get savvy with systems. We have to realize that the economy is based in many different systems that are integrated together, that are having an impact on each other. We have agricultural systems, energy systems, political systems, all these systems are interacting with each other. And if we don't change the systems, if we don't have systemic transformation, we won't be able to live safely within that donut. Fifth, we should design the economy to distribute, to distribute in such a way that we don't have the gross inequity, the gross inequality that we currently have within the human community. She says, instead of seeing inequality as something that is acceptable or that something that always must happen, we should see inequality as a design failure a design failure, and we should be exploring ways of redistributing wealth. Sixth, she argues that we should create to regenerate. And what she means by this is that ecological degradation, just like inequality is a design failure in the economy, ecological degradation is also a design failure. Ecological degradation is simply the result of degenerative industrial design, a linear economy as opposed to a circular economy. A linear economy has waste. A circular economy attempts to waste nothing and to stay within the means of the planet. And then finally, seventh, she says we should be agnostic about growth. We Unitarians are pretty good at being agnostic about things sometimes. We should be agnostic about growth. And being agnostic about growth is the only way to overcome our addiction to GDP growth, gross domestic product growth. She says it's going to be a lot easier to come to the realization that we ought to no longer focus so much on GDP than it is going to be to overcome our addiction to growth of the GDP. Ray Worth will be the first to recognize, as we've already seen, that no model and no picture can be completely adequate in capturing the dynamic complexity of our economic systems. But some models and some pictures are more helpful than others. And I would humbly suggest that Ray Worth's image of the donut as the space of thriving in balance is a better model for our economy than our current addiction to economic growth that often ignores the human deprivation of growing inequality and the ecological degradation we are currently experiencing all over the world. So I say, let's have a go at living within the donut where everyone's needs are met while living within our planetary means. Our parting thought comes from Ban Ki-moon on sustainable development. Ours is a world of looming challenges and increasingly limited resources. Sustainable development offers the best chance to adjust our course. We are using resources as if we had two planets, not one. There can be no plan B because there is no planet B.